The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. The Curious Case of Benjamin Button by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Part 1. Introduction. This story was inspired by a remark of Mark Twain's to the effect that it was a pity that the best part of life came at the beginning and the worst part at the end. By trying the experiment upon only one man in a perfectly normal world, I have scarcely given his idea a fair trial. Several weeks after completing it, I discovered an almost identical plot in Samuel Butler's notebooks. The story was published in Collier's last summer and provoked this startling letter from an anonymous admirer in Cincinnati. Sir, I have read the story Benjamin Button in Collier's, and I wish to say that as a short story writer you would make a good lunatic. I have seen many pieces of cheese in my life, pieces spelled P-E-I-C-E-S, but of all the pieces of cheese I have ever seen, you are the biggest piece. I hate to waste a piece of stationery on you, but I will. End of the Introduction Chapter 1 As long ago as 1860, it was the proper thing to be born at home. At present, so I am told, the high gods of medicine have decreed that the first cries of the young shall be uttered upon the anesthetic air of a hospital, preferably a fashionable one. So young Mr. and Mrs. Roger Button were fifty years ahead of style when they decided, one day in the summer of 1860, that their first baby should be born in a hospital. Whether this anachronism had any bearing upon the astonishing history I am about to set down will never be known. I shall tell you what occurred, and let you judge for yourself. The Roger Buttons held an enviable position, both social and financial, in antebellum Baltimore. They were related to the this family and the that family, which, as every Southerner knew, entitled them to membership in that enormous peerage which largely populated the Confederacy. This was their first experience with the charming old custom of having babies. Mr. Button was naturally nervous. He hoped it would be a boy so that he could be sent to Yale College in Connecticut, at which institution Mr. Button himself had been known for four years by the somewhat obvious nickname of Cuff. On the September morning consecrated to the enormous event, he arose nervously at six o'clock, dressed himself, adjusted an impeccable stock, and hurried forth through the streets of Baltimore to the hospital, to determine whether the darkness of the night had borne in new life upon its bosom. When he was approximately a hundred yards from the Maryland private hospital for ladies and gentlemen, he saw Dr. Keene, the family physician, descending the front steps, rubbing his hands together with a washing movement, as all doctors are required to do by the unwritten ethics of their profession. Mr. Roger Button, the president of Roger Button & Company, Wholesale Hardware, began to run toward Dr. Keene with much less dignity than was expected from a southern gentleman of that picturesque period. "'Dr. Keene!' he called. "'Oh, Dr. Keene!' The doctor heard him, faced around, and stood waiting, a curious expression settling on his harsh, medicinal face as Mr. Button drew near. "'What happened?' demanded Mr. Button, as he came up in a gasping rush. "'What was it? How is she? A boy? Who is it? What?' "'Talk sense,' said Dr. Keene sharply. He appeared somewhat irritated. "'Is the child born?' begged Mr. Button. Dr. Keene frowned. "'Why, yes, I suppose so, after a fashion.' Again he threw a curious glance at Mr. Button. "'Is my wife all right?' "'Yes.' "'Is it a boy or a girl?' "'Here now,' cried Dr. Keene, in a perfect passion of irritation. "'I'll ask you to go and see for yourself. Outrageous!' He snapped the last word out in almost one syllable. Then he turned away, muttering, do you imagine a case like this will help my professional reputation? One more would ruin me, ruin anybody. What's the matter? demanded Mr. Button, appalled. Triplets? No, not triplets, answered the doctor cuttingly. What's more, you can go and see for yourself, and get another doctor. I brought you into the world, young man, and I've been physician to your family for forty years, but I'm through with you. I don't want to see you or any of your relatives ever again. Good-bye. 
Then he turned sharply, and without another word climbed into his phaeton, which was waiting at the curbstone, and drove severely away. Mr. Button stood there upon the sidewalk, stupefied and trembling from head to foot. What horrible mishap had occurred? He had suddenly lost all desire to go into the Maryland Private Hospital for Ladies and Gentlemen. It was with the greatest difficulty that, a moment later, he forced himself to mount the steps and enter the front door. A nurse was sitting behind a desk in the opaque gloom of the hall. Swallowing his shame, Mr. Button approached her. "'Good morning,' she remarked, looking up at him pleasantly. "'Good morning. I, I am Mr. Button.' At this a look of utter terror spread itself over the girl's face. She rose to her feet and seemed about to fly from the hall, restraining herself only with the most apparent difficulty. "'I want to see my child,' said Mr. Button. The nurse gave a little scream. "'Oh, of course!' she cried hysterically. "'Upstairs! Right upstairs! Go up!' She pointed the direction, and Mr. Button, bathed in a cool perspiration, turned falteringly, and began to mount to the second floor. In the upper hall he addressed another nurse who approached him, basin in hand. "'I'm Mr. Button,' he managed to articulate. "'I want to see my—' Clank! The basin clattered to the floor and rolled in the direction of the stairs. Clank! Clank! It began a methodical descent, as if sharing in the general terror which this gentleman provoked. "'I want to see my child!' Mr. Button almost shrieked. He was on the verge of collapse. Clank! The basin had reached the first floor. The nurse regained control of herself, and threw Mr. Button a look of hearty contempt. "'All right, Mr. Button,' she agreed in a hushed voice. "'Very well.' "'But if you knew what state it's put us all in this morning, "'it's perfectly outrageous. "'The hospital will never have the ghost of a reputation after—' "'Hurry!' he cried hoarsely. "'I can't stand this!' "'Come this way, then, Mr. Button.' "'He dragged himself after her. "'At the end of a long hall they reached a room "'from which proceeded a variety of howls. "'Indeed, a room which, in later parlance, "'would have been known as the crying room.' They entered. "'Well,' gasped Mr. Button, "'which is mine?' "'There,' said the nurse. Mr. Button's eyes followed her pointing finger, and this is what he saw. Wrapped in a voluminous white blanket, and partially crammed into one of the cribs, there sat an old man, apparently about seventy years of age. His sparse hair was almost white, and from his chin dripped a long, smoke-colored beard, which waved absurdly back and forth, fanned by the breeze coming in at the window. He looked up at Mr. Button with dim, faded eyes, in which lurked a puzzled question. "'Am I mad?' thundered Mr. Button, his terror resolving into rage. "'Is this some ghastly hospital joke?' "'It doesn't seem like a joke to us,' replied the nurse severely. "'And I don't know whether you're mad or not, but that is most certainly your child.' The cool perspiration redoubled on Mr. Button's forehead. He closed his eyes, and then, opening them, looked again. There was no mistake. He was gazing at a man of threescore and ten, a baby of threescore and ten, a baby whose feet hung over the sides of the crib in which it was reposing. The old man looked placidly from one to the other for a moment, and then suddenly spoke in a cracked and ancient voice. "'Are you my father?' he demanded. Mr. Button and the nurse started violently. "'Because if you are,' went on the old man querulously, "'I wish you'd get me out of this place, or at least get them to put a comfortable rocker in here.' "'Where in God's name did you come from? Who are you?' burst out Mr. Button frantically. "'I can't tell you exactly who I am,' replied the querulous whine, "'because I've only been born a few hours, but my last name is certainly Button.' "'You lie! You're an impostor. The old man turned wearily to the nurse. "'Nice way to welcome a new-born child,' he complained in a weak voice. "'Tell him he's wrong, why don't you?' "'You're wrong, Mr. Button,' said the nurse severely. 
This is your child, and you'll have to make the best of it. We're going to ask you to take him home with you as soon as possible, sometime today. Home? repeated Mr. Button incredulously. Yes, we can't have him here. We really can't, you know. I'm right glad of it, whined the old man. This is a fine place to keep a youngster of quiet tastes. With all this yelling and howling, I haven't been able to get a wink of sleep. I asked for something to eat. Here his voice rose to a shrill note of protest. And they brought me a bottle of milk! Mr. Button sank down upon a chair near his son, and concealed his face in his hands. "'My heavens!' he murmured in an ecstasy of horror. "'What will people say? What must I do?' "'You'll have to take him home,' insisted the nurse. "'Immediately!' A grotesque picture formed himself with dreadful clarity before the eyes of the tortured man. A picture of himself walking through the crowded streets of the city with this appalling apparition stalking by his side. "'I can't! I can't!' he moaned. People would stop to speak to him, and what was he going to say? He would have to introduce this, this septuagenarian. "'This is my son, born early this morning.' And then the old man would gather his blanket around him, and they would plod on, past the bustling stores, the slave market— for a dark instant Mr. Button wished passionately that his son was black, past the luxurious houses of the residential district, past the home for the aged. "'Come, pull yourself together,' commanded the nurse. "'See here,' the old man announced suddenly. "'If you think I'm going to walk home in this blanket, you're entirely mistaken.' "'Babies always have blankets.' With a malicious crackle, the old man held up a small white swaddling garment. "'Look,' he quavered, "'this is what they had ready for me.' "'Babies always wear those,' said the nurse primly. "'Well,' said the old man, "'this baby's not going to wear anything in about two minutes. This blanket itches. It might at least have given me a sheet.' "'Keep it on, keep it on,' said Mr. Button hurriedly. He turned to the nurse. "'What'll I do?' "'Go downtown and buy your son some clothes.' Mr. Button's son's voice followed him down into the hall. "'And a cane, father. I want to have a cane.' Mr. Button banged the outer door savagely. Chapter 2 "'Good morning,' Mr. Button said, nervously, to the clerk in the Chesapeake Dry Goods Company. I want to buy some clothes for my child. How old is your child, sir? About six hours, answered Mr. Button, without due consideration. Baby's supply department in the rear. Why, I don't think, I'm not sure that's what I want. It's, he's an unusually large-sized child. Exceptionally, uh, large. They have the largest child sizes. "'Where is the boys' department?' inquired Mr. Button, shifting his ground desperately. He felt that the clerk must surely scent his shameful secret. "'Right here.' "'Well,' he hesitated. The notion of dressing his son in men's clothes was repugnant to him. If, say, he could only find a very large boy suit, he might cut off that long and awful beard, dye the white hair brown, and thus manage to conceal the worst— and to retain something of his own self-respect, not to mention his position in Baltimore society. But a frantic inspection of the boys' department revealed no suits to fit the newborn button. He blamed the store, of course. In such cases, it is the thing to blame the store. "'How old did you say that boy of yours was?' demanded the clerk curiously. "'He's sixteen. "'Oh, I beg your pardon. I thought you said six hours.' You'll find the youth department in the next aisle. Mr. Button turned miserably away. Then he stopped, brightened, and pointed his finger toward a dressed dummy in the window display. There, he exclaimed. I'll take that suit out there on the dummy. The clerk stared. Why, he protested, that's not a child suit. At least it is, but it's for fancy dress. You could wear it yourself. Wrap it up insisted his customer nervously. 
That's what I want. The astonished clerk obeyed. Back at the hospital, Mr. Button entered the nursery and almost threw the package at his son. Here's your clothes, he snapped out. The old man untied the package and viewed the contents with a quizzical eye. They look sort of funny to me, he complained. I don't want to be made a monkey of. You've made a monkey of me, retorted Mr. Button fiercely. Never you mind how funny you look. Put them on or I'll or I'll spank you. He swallowed uneasily at the penultimate word, feeling nevertheless that it was the proper thing to say. All right, father, this with a grotesque simulation of filial respect. You've lived longer, you know best, just as you say. As before, the sound of the word father caused Mr. Button to start violently. And hurry. I'm hurrying, father. When his son was dressed, Mr. Button regarded him with depression. The costume consisted of dotted socks, pink pants, and a belted blouse with a wide white collar. Over the latter waved the long whitish beard, drooping almost to the waist. The effect was not good. Wait! Mr. Button seized a hospital shears, and with three quick snaps amputated a large section of the beard. But even with this improvement, the ensemble fell far short of perfection. The remaining brush of scraggly hair, the watery eyes, the ancient teeth, seemed oddly out of tone with the gaiety of the costume. Mr. Button, however, was obdurate. He held out his hand. "'Come along,' he said sternly. His son took the hand trustingly. "'What are you going to call me, Dad?' he quavered as they walked from the nursery. Just baby for a while, till you think of a better name? Mr. Button grunted. I don't know, he answered harshly. I think we'll call you Methuselah. Chapter 3 Even after the new addition to the Button family had had his hair cut short and then dyed to a sparse, unnatural black, had had his face shaved so close that it glistened, and had been attired in a small boy clothes made to order by a flabbergasted tailor, it was impossible for Mr. Button to ignore the fact that his son was a poor excuse for a first family baby. Despite his aged stoop, Benjamin Button, for it was by this name they called him instead of by the appropriate but invidious Methuselah, was five feet eight inches tall. His clothes did not conceal this, nor did the clipping and dyeing of his eyebrows disguise the fact that the eyes underneath were faded and watery and tired. In fact, the baby nurse, who had been engaged in advance, left the house after one look, in a state of considerable indignation. But Mr. Button persisted in his unwavering purpose. Benjamin was a baby, and a baby he should remain. At first he declared that if Benjamin didn't like warm milk, he could go without food altogether. But he was finally prevailed upon to allow his son bread and butter, and even oatmeal by way of a compromise. One day he brought home a rattle, and, giving it to Benjamin, insisted in no uncertain terms that he should play with it, whereupon the old man took it with a weary expression, and could be heard jingling it obediently at intervals throughout the day. There can be no doubt, though, that the rattle bored him, and that he found other and more soothing amusements when he was left alone. For instance, Mr. Button discovered one day that during the preceding week he had smoked more cigars than ever before a phenomenon which was explained a few days later when, entering the nursery unexpectedly, he found the room full of faint blue haze, and Benjamin, with a guilty expression on his face, trying to conceal the butt of a dark Havana. This, of course, called for a severe spanking, but Mr. Button found that he could not bring himself to administer it. He merely warned his son that he would stunt his growth. Nevertheless, he persisted in his attitude. He brought home lead soldiers, he brought toy trains, he brought large pleasant animals made of cotton, and to perfect the illusion which he was creating, for himself at least, he passionately demanded of the clerk in the toy store whether the paint would come off the pink duck if the baby put it in his mouth. But despite all his father's efforts, Benjamin refused to be interested. He would steal down the back stairs and return to the nursery with a volume of the Encyclopedia Britannica, over which he would pour through an afternoon, while his cotton cows and his Noah's Ark were left neglected on the floor. 
Against such a stubbornness, Mr. Button's efforts were of little avail. The sensation created in Baltimore was, at first, prodigious. What the mishap would have cost the Buttons and their kinsfolk socially cannot be determined, for the outbreak of the Civil War drew the city's attention to other things. A few people who were unfailingly polite racked their brains for compliments to give to the parents, and finally hit upon the ingenious device of declaring that the baby resembled his grandfather, a fact which, due to the standard state of decay common to all men of seventy, could not be denied. Mr. and Mrs. Roger Button were not pleased, and Benjamin's grandfather was furiously insulted. Benjamin, once he left the hospital, took life as he found it. Several small boys were brought to see him, and he spent a stiff-jointed afternoon trying to work up an interest in tops and marbles. He even managed, quite accidentally, to break a kitchen window with a stone from a slingshot, a feat which secretly delighted his father. Thereafter Benjamin contrived to break something every day, but he did these things only because they were expected of him, and because he was by nature obliging. When his grandfather's initial antagonism wore off, Benjamin and that gentleman took enormous pleasure in one another's company. They would sit for hours, these two so far apart in age and experience, and, like old cronies, discuss with tireless monotony the slow events of the day. Benjamin felt more at ease in his grandfather's presence than in his parents'. They seemed always somewhat in awe of him, and, despite the dictatorial authority they exercised over him, frequently addressed him as Mr. He was as puzzled as anyone else at the apparently advanced age of his mind and body at birth. He read up on it in the medical journal, but found that no such case had been previously recorded. At his father's urging, he made an honest attempt to play with other boys, and frequently he joined in the milder games. Football shook him up too much, and he feared that in case of a fracture his ancient bones would refuse to knit. When he was five he was sent to kindergarten, where he was initiated into the art of pasting green paper on orange paper, of weaving colored maps, and manufacturing eternal cardboard necklaces. He was inclined to drowse off to sleep in the middle of these tasks, a habit which both irritated and frightened his young teacher. To his relief she complained to his parents, and he was removed from the school. The Roger Buttons told their friends that they felt he was too young. By the time he was twelve years old, his parents had grown used to him. Indeed, so strong is the force of custom that they no longer felt that he was different from any other child, except when some curious anomaly reminded them of the fact. But one day, a few weeks after his twelfth birthday, while looking in the mirror, Benjamin made, or thought he made, an astonishing discovery. Did his eyes deceive him, or had his hair turned in the dozen years of his life from white to iron gray under its concealing dye? Was the network of wrinkles on his face becoming less pronounced? Was his skin healthier and firmer, with even a touch of ruddy winter color? He could not tell. He knew that he no longer stooped, and that his physical condition had improved since the early days of his life. Can it be? he thought to himself or rather, scarcely dared to think. He went to his father. I am grown, he announced determinedly. I want to put on long trousers. His father hesitated. Well, he said finally, I don't know. Fourteen is the age for putting on long trousers, and you are only twelve. But you'll have to admit, protested Benjamin, that I am big for my age. His father looked at him with illusory speculation. "'Oh, I'm not so sure of that,' he said. "'I was as big as you when I was twelve. This was not true. It was all part of Roger Button's silent agreement with himself to believe in his son's normality. Finally, a compromise was reached. Benjamin was to continue to dye his hair. He was to make a better attempt to play with boys of his own age. He was not to wear his spectacles or carry a cane in the street. In return for these concessions, he was allowed his first suit of long trousers. Chapter 4 Of the life of Benjamin Button between his twelfth and twenty-first year, I intend to say little. Suffice to record that they were years of normal ungrowth. When Benjamin was eighteen, he was erect as a man of fifty. He had more hair, and it was of a dark gray. His step was firm, his voice had lost its cracked quality.
quaver and descended to a healthy baritone. So his father sent him up to Connecticut to take examinations for entrance to Yale College. Benjamin passed his examination and became a member of the freshman class. On the third day following his matriculation, he received a notification from Mr. Hart, the college registrar, to call at his office and arrange his schedule. Benjamin, glancing in the mirror, decided that his hair needed a new application of its brown dye, but an anxious inspection of his bureau drawer disclosed that the dye bottle was not there. Then he remembered he had emptied it the day before and thrown it away. He was in a dilemma. He was due at the registrar's in five minutes. There seemed to be no help for it. He must go as he was. He did. "'Good morning,' said the registrar politely. "'You've come to inquire about your son.' "'Why, as a matter of fact, my name's Button,' began Benjamin, but Mr. Hart cut him off. "'I'm very glad to meet you, Mr. Button. I'm expecting your son here any minute.' "'That's me,' burst out Benjamin. "'I'm a freshman.' "'What?' I'm a freshman. Surely you're joking. Not at all. The registrar frowned and glanced at a card before him. Why, I have Mr. Benjamin Button's age down here as eighteen. That's my age, asserted Benjamin, flushing slightly. The registrar eyed him wearily. Now, surely, Mr. Button, you don't expect me to believe that. Benjamin smiled wearily. I am eighteen, he repeated. The registrar pointed sternly to the door. Get out, he said. Get out of college and get out of town. You are a dangerous lunatic. I am eighteen. Mr. Hart opened the door. The idea, he shouted. A man of your age trying to enter here as a freshman. Eighteen years old, are you? Well, I'll give you eighteen minutes to get out of town. Benjamin Button walked with dignity from the room, and half a dozen undergraduates, who were waiting in the hall, followed him curiously with their eyes. When he had gone a little way, he turned around, faced the infuriated registrar, who was still standing in the doorway, and repeated in a firm voice, I am eighteen years old. To a chorus of titters which went up from the group of undergraduates, Benjamin walked away. But he was not fated to escape so easily. On his melancholy walk to the railroad station, he found that he was being followed by a group, then by a swarm, and finally by a dense mass of undergraduates. The word had gone around that a lunatic had passed the entrance examinations for Yale and attempted to palm himself off as a youth of eighteen. A fever of excitement permeated the college. Men ran hatless out of classes. The football team abandoned its practice and joined the mob. Professors' wives, with bonnets awry and bustles out of position, ran shouting after the procession, from which proceeded a continual succession of remarks aimed at the tender sensibilities of Benjamin Button. He must be the wandering Jew. He ought to go to prep school at his age. Look at the infant prodigy. He thought this was the old men's home. Go up to Harvard. Benjamin increased his gait and soon he was running. He would show them. He would go to Harvard, and then they would regret these ill-considered taunts. Safely on board the train for Baltimore, he put his head from the window. "'You'll regret this!' he shouted. "'Ha-ha!' the undergraduates laughed. "'Ha-ha-ha!' It was the biggest mistake that Yale College had ever made. End of Part 1